Welcome back to Let's Code. Today we are diving into WebAssembly and front-end web development in Rust with you. So what is you? I just said it, but I'll say it again. You is a modern Rust framework for creating web apps using WebAssembly. It includes features that front-end developers have gotten used to having, such as components. They claim great performance, but speaking honestly, what framework doesn't claim great performance? And it supports JavaScript interoperability, which could be very important to you. Today, we'll be going through the U tutorial and taking a look at what the APIs look like and what it means to write HTML in Rust. The tutorial covers building a site to view talks from the RustConf 2020 event. As far as dependencies go, we'll need Rust because we're writing a Rust application. So it would be, you know, weird if we didn't have Rust. We'll use Trunk, which is a tool for building Wasm applications that I've seen used in a couple of other front-end frameworks in Rust, such as Sycamore. And we need to have the Wasm32 unknown unknown target installed. So I'll get started by installing Trunk because I don't currently have it on this computer for this version of Rust. And after Trunk is installed, I will make sure that I have the Wasm32 unknown unknown target, which I do already have. We need a new cargo project, so I'll do cargo new YouTube view app tutorial, and we'll head right into that directory if I can type today. <laughs> it says the project is already set up, so let's just run it and see what happens. So we get hello world. The tutorial wants us to make two changes, including adding the U dependency, which we'll do right now. And I'll kick open the cargo toml to show you that it is indeed here. And then we'll open source main.rs to drop in the code they want us to use here. So we're bringing in the U prelude here. So all of the items and scope for the U prelude, we have a function component macro, which is, I believe, how we define components in a U world. So this would be kind of the same thing as defining um, a function in React and having it be a component, or however you've seen components done before, like in Vue, et cetera. The component itself is a regular function that returns the HTML type or the HTML struct, which we can construct using the HTML macro. The HTML macro allows us to put in something that looks a little bit like JSX, but you'll notice that these curly braces are always there. And then in our main function, we've got this special start app with a type argument of the component that we're building to kickstart our application. And the root of the project will create an index.html and drop in a simple HTML tag, a head, a body, and that's about it. With this code written, instead of using cargo run for the next build, we'll use trunk serve. And I'm gonna get rid of the open flag because I don't like when things open automatically <laughs> in some random browser tab, but it looks like we're gonna deal with localhost 8080. So I'll click that and we get a hello world right in the left-hand side here. And I'll just let that run in the background. Trunk of course is responsible for watching all of our source files and compiling them. So you can see that we have this dist folder here with our Wasm and JavaScript files. And as we make changes to our Rust files and things like that, Trunk will build these files into the distribution directory. So we can see that there has been a script inserted here that pulls in the JavaScript file that's built and includes some development tooling to make sure that these pages reload when we actually make changes. This functionality is referred to as either live reload or hot reloading, depending on how it's implemented and who's calling it. Our JavaScript file that gets built bootstraps our Wasm. So if you look at the JavaScript file, you'll see a bunch of things like drop object, take object, debug string, some Wasm names and other useful tidbits. Most importantly though, it initializes the WebAssembly module. Inside of our main.rs, it wants us to replace our HTML macro with something a little bit more complicated. So we'll go ahead and do that. Now, I don't know how this is implemented in you, but the fragment at the root is something that I typically try to avoid because in other front end frameworks, when you have a fragment at the root of your application, that can mean that your elements don't get keys and things can result in um, getting a little bit of weird bugs if you do things like render on the server and the client um, and there's no key for the element that you're actually trying to render. But aside from that, this is the way the tutorial does it. So this is the way that I'll keep doing it. And I will just mention that that could be a thing to look out for if you're doing server-side rendering in the future. Other than that, you can see that we have a bunch of HTML here. It's all wrapped in curly braces, which being somebody who has written JavaScript for a decade 
and having had a lot of contact with HTML and also JSX, I don't love having to put braces everywhere for regular text. I don't mind it for variables, but it it's not the not my favorite for text. So anyway, we've saved this and we can see it on the left hand side here. We've got the Rust Conf Explorer videos to watch, a list of videos, and then presumably the current video. Now, because we're using Rust, it would be nice if we could use typed data, such as for each video, we would like to store it as a struct called video with some fields on it. The tutorial tells you to use website test tutorial video to get this video struct in, but they also tell you to put it in main.rs. So suffice it to say that I'm going to remove that use because this is in main.rs already. So we already have access to it. Then in our app function component, we set up a videos variable that is a vec of a bunch of videos. Presumably this would be data that comes back from an API. So we wouldn't have just this random set of data laying around inside of our component, but you know, this works too for the moment. Next up, we do have to convert these videos into something we can actually display. So we want to basically take the, this data and render it as HTML. So we can use Rust idioms to do that, by doing videos.iter, which is the vec of video structs, mapping over that, taking a video, and returning an HTML macro from this closure. This HTML macro is just a p tag with a format inside of it, defining the speaker on the left, a colon, and then the speaker on the right. We can then collect this iterator over what are now HTML elements into HTML. And that's what videos will be if we look at it. We'll see that we're collecting this into HTML, which actually turns this into a virtual node or a V node, which I'm not gonna talk about right now. So we can totally get rid of that list of videos now and drop in the videos right below the H3. Now we have to drop in the videos, which is a variable reference surrounded by curly braces, which is very similar to the way that it works in JSX, in React land and anything else that uses JSX like Preact or anything like that. And you can see on the left that we still have our list of videos. Now, one thing that I would do if I was building this application for real is I probably would have turned this map into its own component. It would also be kind of nice if there were a way to define on a trait like video.into or something like that, maybe. I don't know. TBD. The code in the tutorial is kind of strange because um, it includes code that has already been written. So you can't just like copy and paste chunks, but it also like doesn't show pieces of code that are already written. So it goes both ways. It like doesn't show you code that's already there. And then it also doubles code that is already there. So if you just straight copy and paste this back and forth, um, you'll end up with too much code or a duplicate code or something like that. So just be aware of that if you're going through the U tutorial. So to create this function component, we're gonna call it videos list, which is interesting because this name that we put in the function component argument is going to be the name of the component we use. It's not going to be this function. This function, however, does need to accept some arguments, which we need to create as a struct. And we also need to derive properties for it. So if you're used to using react or something like that, you'll know that functions accept a list of arguments called props. This is our props. In this case, in particular, the arguments are coming in and this syntax may look odd to you, but you could type it like this as well. So we're getting a videos list props struct or a shared reference to one, which contains a videos, which has a vec of videos. So if I remove my little modification there, we're destructuring the videos field out of the videos list props type. So this is just destructuring the argument. This function of course returns HTML and it contains the code that we had before in our application to render the list. Now, if you look at the trunk compilation, so that this is gonna be the cargo build output, we still have an issue here. And it's going to say that binary operation not equals cannot be applied to vec video. And that's because videos list props requires that the vec of video influence partial equality because we're deriving partial equality for it. And video does not derive partial equality. Now this is enough to get the code compiling for me, but the tutorial also wants us to write clone in here. So I'm gonna write clone in here, even though it isn't strictly necessary at the moment. And then we can go down into our application and remove the code that we had before for rendering out the list. And right below the H3 where we had videos before, we can render a videos list videos equals videos. And this is how we build up 
individual components that we can then use to compose together a larger application. Of course, that's not enough for us. So we are going to register an on click inside of our videos list props. And you'll see immediately that Rust Analyzer picks up on the fact that we aren't uh, fully destructuring the videos list props in our function component. So here we'll need to grab on click. Now we can drop in some code into our videos list to handle the click. So we take the on click handler that we're getting passed in, we clone it. We're cloning the video as well. So this is why we needed to derive clone on the props earlier. And then we use this callback type to construct a, what we would consider a JavaScript callback to emit the video when it's clicked. So in this case, what we're doing is we're bootstrapping this closure with the video data for this element. And then we're going to take this on video select and in this case, apply it to this paragraph tag right here. So on click on video select. From a UI standpoint, I don't know that I would put an on click handler on a paragraph tag like this, but it's a tutorial and we're not really covering front end UI basics, I guess. So we'll just drop it on this paragraph tag like the tutorial tells us to. Now, before we actually can make use of that on click, the tutorial tells us to create a new component called video details. So basically when we click on one of these, we want to be able to render those details. So the same way that we abstracted a component to render this list out of movie options at the top here, we're going to abstract a another component out to render these details about the selected video. So on the right hand side, we've got the video details props, which has a single video, which is that video struct type, and we derive properties for it. And we define a video details component with this video details function that destructures that video out of the props and returns us some HTML. In this case, we're cloning the video title to render it out. And then we're rendering a placeholder image just like we have over here on the left. Down in our application then, we can use hooks for the first time or what would be considered hooks in React. They're not actually hooks because we're not actually using React. <laughs> but it's a very similar concept. So we're gonna use state and we're going to pass a closure in that returns the value none for the initial state of selected video. Then we're going to define on video select using a block expression, which basically just lets us construct this callback. So we can do selected video dot clone. We can move this selected video into the closure here. So we're using the move keyword to accept this video and then move in the selected video. So the containing environment is getting pulled in for us and we're setting that value to some video instead of none. So this on video select callback, we're returning this callback is getting created from this closure. So it's just a closure that accepts a video and calls set on this selected video state. So whenever we click on one of these paragraphs, it should update this state then. Of course, for it to do that, we have to be able to take that selected video and then map over it. So basically, if this is none, then this map is not going to run. And we'll take this video that is in that state and we'll render out the video details component for that video if it exists. If it doesn't, then details is none. So if we scroll down to our videos list component, we can see that we haven't passed in the on click yet. So I'll pass in on click equals on video select dot clone. So we're cloning that closure in. I'm going to modify the syntax here a little bit to fit a little bit better on the screen. And I'll just add that um, basically none of the macro HTML is getting formatted for me. And I don't know what the answer to that is because it would be incredibly annoying from a personal perspective for me to continually write all of these HTML macros and not have this HTML auto formatted for me. Now we're kind of pulling a little trick here, which I don't, I don't love tricks, but option so this details option implements iterator so if we do four details then we're somehow iterating over this option and displaying the that component this feels very awkward to me um and i need to wrap my head around it a little bit more because i understand that you can iterate over an option for example or you can map over an option like we did before but four option feels like awkward syntax so I'll have to log that in my brain. But that entirely gives us the result. So we have a list now that we can click on any of these paragraph tags. And the closure that we defined will display 
In this case, it's just changing the title, but it'll display whatever video we want for video details. So this is all well and good and it works. It's about 120 lines of code for the entire application. I immediately would feel better if a bunch of these components were written into their own files. I will say that it feels a little weird to have to define the name of this component and also the function name below it. So I would love if there was some generation of this component name. So if we could do videos list here and it would combine into being videos list. But a lot of the idioms are very similar. I think the only syntax that I stumble over or will stumble over the first couple times I use it will be this for details, which I'll have to make another video on because that is interesting syntax. I definitely would have expected this to be something a little bit more like just being able to put details here and either getting none or some unwrapped for me or having to unwrap it myself and place it in or do some kind of if condition. That said, we can move on and actually request data from the internet. So cargo add glue net is going to be the library we use for requests. Saturday and wasm bind gen futures. And I'm going to turn on the Saturday derive. I think that syntax is correct. Derive feature. So if I look at the cargo toml, we should see Saturday with the derive feature, glue net and wasm bind gen futures. So for our videos, we actually aren't going to define them in our project. We're going to do pull them in from the internet. So we're going to bring in Saturday deserialize and derive deserialize for video so that we can deserialize it from our API request. And then instead of let videos here where we define all of those videos, I'm going to get rid of that. And we're going to have this whole chunk of code. Know that there's this request here and we do need to bring in glue net HTTP request. So I've had Rust Analyzer do that for us. And I'm going to trunk serve to get this to build. So what are we doing here? Because <laughs> this is a whole chunk of code. We're doing another use state and we're defining use state as an empty vec for the videos that we wanted to render. We then define a new block and that's a little bit awkward, but it's just creating another scope for us. So we let videos equals videos.clone and then we're use affecting with depths. So this I know from my React work is going to run effectively anytime any of our dependencies change. So if I scroll down, it looks like we have dependencies of unit, which I know from my React work will mean that this use effect runs once when the page loads and never again. The use effect takes a closure, so we move any uh, variables that we're using in. That's why we're cloning this videos. We define, we define videos again, which feels a little bit like overkill, but we define videos again, and then we spawn local from Wasm bind and futures to actually execute the fetch. So the fetch is a get to u.rs tutorial data JSON, which will get built with dot send, which we can then await because it returns a future, which we can unwrap because it returns a result, which we can dot JSON because we want the JSON value, which we can await because it returns a future, which we can unwrap because it returns a result, resulting in <laughs> a vec of videos. The way this whole, whole thing sets up feels complicated to me. It feels like I would do it in a different way, but Let's just keep going through the tutorial and we can have videos.set with our deserialized JSON data. So videos again is the state holder. So we're basically, I assume, cloning a handle and not the data here. And then for some reason, we return a closure that returns unit from move or from use our closure. So I guess this would be a cleanup function. That's what, uh, that's just guessing from my previous work with React. Uh, but that effectively runs once on page load for the app component on mount to fetch the data and put it into videos. So we'll render once without that data and we'll render again once that data comes in. So if we look at videos, videos is a use state handle vec video and videos list wants this props value. So we're going to dereference videos, which should give us the actual underlying value, which we can then clone to pass into videos. And interestingly, they stick you with an issue of needing to implement some cores issues. So the cores issue here is that we're making a request from localhost to the u.rs site. 
So they want you to set up a proxy server, which I don't feel like is something we should be doing in this tutorial, but I believe that's just a matter of changing the URL in this case. So in request get, we will now look for slash tutorial slash data dot JSON, which will fail because we're not requesting anything right now. And then when we run trunk serve, we're going to have to use a proxy backend. So we're going to do trunk serve proxy backend to HTTPS u.rs slash tutorial. And we run that and we refresh this tab, hopefully. So I'm still having an issue. So I'm going to take a look at the data JSON response, which is actually returning HTML for me. And it looks like it's returning the HTML file that we are serving. So our root index.html, which means that this or the proxy backend are wrong. One of them is wrong. So because this is u.rs slash tutorial, I'm gonna get rid of that in the actual URL that we're using over here. So I'm gonna do slash data and see if that gives us the right query. And that doesn't either. You can see the error here if you've got a big enough screen. But basically what's happening here is that this request that they've told us to make is not actually getting JSON back. It's getting trunk stuff back, specifically that index.html. So this dash dash proxy backend is supposed to be routing anything at slash tutorial. So our request on the right slash tutorial slash data dot JSON to u.rs slash tutorial slash data dot JSON. And as far as I can tell, that is not actually what is happening. You can see in the logs here, it says proxying slash tutorial to u.rs slash tutorial, which it should be doing. But if we look at the data JSON response, we are seeing the HTML file, the index.html file from trunk. So there's something wrong with the proxying setup here. Um, and I will leave a comment in the description for what that is when I figure it out. But as far as I can tell, this is supposed to work. So it's time to go check out the GitHub issues for you and the tutorial and see why the proxy isn't working. But other than that, this is our application. It doesn't look great. So we did no CSS work, but if we had the working version of it, we would have this list that we can click on that would update the movies here. And it is working. I don't know that it's my favorite way to write front end code. There's a couple of things that I would like to figure out how to change. For example, this huge line of unwrap, fetch, unwrap, fetch, whatever, whatever, but we'll see. So I hope you enjoyed this look into view and I will see you in the next video.